Thank you very much. It's uh, great to be here in Rio, great for a number of reasons. Number one, I managed to get my visa, which uh, our colleague John did not. I got it two hours before my flight, got jammed into the last seat in the last row of a flight from Paris. And in the 11-hour flight, I went through my presentation. It took me 24 minutes. I'm told I have 15 today, so forgive me if I, uh, if I move a little fast. <clears throat> it's also great to be here. This is our first major event in the Western Hemisphere and also first major event south of the equator. So I may be a little disoriented. So apologies, self-deprecation out there. Um, five days ago, I was celebrating Christmas in Serbia, and my son came up to me and said, you know, Dad, I hear you're talking about this new kind of money and stuff. I heard something about Bitcoin. Can you buy me a Bitcoin? Give me a Bitcoin for Christmas. And I said, what? I said, $12,750. You're 13 years old. Why do you need $13,150? So joking aside, it has been a, uh, been a fantastic year in cryptocurrency. I want to talk a little bit about what we saw in 2017 and how we're, uh, how we're viewing 2018 and positioning accordingly. I think in Terry's presentation, you saw something very similar to this, but I think it is a big story. Bitcoin is really, to this point, has been the, uh, the Leroy Brown of the crypto space. It's the biggest, baddest in town. Um, at the beginning of the year, January 1st, we saw Bitcoin was $979. Uh, at the beginning of this year, it was 13425 That's a 13x increase. Another important point on this slide, uh, if you see, look at the legend here, you can see uh, there's actually two lines on that graph. One is the Coinbase price, one is the Gemini price. Uh, they diverge a little bit. <laughs> They diverge a little bit, is that okay? They diverge a little bit during the December volatility associated with, uh, with the options listing in Chicago. But um, I think in the future, what we're gonna see is, um, is an important development. As part of the listing of the options, there's been a Bitcoin reference rate established. Um, that was kind of a, an agreed upon algorithm for the true price of Bitcoin. And there's also the Bitcoin real-time index, which is a very similar uh, mechanism that's used for Bitcoin prices at any given day. Bitcoin clearly, I think, is the most evolved of crypto cryptocurrencies, although I think uh, that's going to change quite a bit this year. Similar story, weekly volume. This is a, about a 13, also about a 13, 14x increase over the course of the year. Notably, since the options listing, we've seen the volume in the second part of the year since the options were listed is five times the weekly average volume of all of 2017. So I think with, uh, there's, a, there's only 600,000 Bitcoin addresses out there that have more than one Bitcoin. Combine that with 15 million new accounts at Coinbase alone and similar millions of new accounts at other exchanges and I think the whole space is going to be exploding in the coming year. Bitcoin of course isn't the only story. This is, uh, this is the price the price graph of, of Ether. Ether was up uh, 92x during the course of 2017 on volume of, and a volume increase of 227x. So um, those are really the top two heavyweights in the space. Um, although I think looking forward, we're going to see many more. Many of us are familiar with this slide. Um, as we went to press, there was the market cap was 777 billion in all of cryptocurrencies. Notably also, the trading volume exceeded 60 billion for, for this 24 hour period. Now these numbers start to get unreal a little bit. What is 60 billion? Yeah, it's a big number, but to put it in perspective, that's a higher trading volume than the daily trading volume on the New York Stock Exchange. The NASDAQ trades a hundred billion a day. Um, Combine that with the fact that the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ are five-day markets and only open for roughly a third of the day, and I think the expectations are pretty unreal for the, for the coming period. Again, as we went to press, there were 39 unicorns, 39 companies uh, in this list, 39 tokens valued at more than, more than $1 billion. So again, an incredible year. Um, been over this slide at past events, but I think it's still relevant. On the left side here, um, you see a football, or I guess since I'm in Brazil, I should say an American football. Um, the volume of that football is $777 billion. It equates roughly to 
to the market capitalization of Alphabet. Um, it is about 10% of the value of the physical gold in the world and also 10% of the physical currency in the world. Moving on, this, these are, uh, this is the cumulative uh, market capitalization of the stock markets in the world. It, it's about 77 trillion, which conveniently makes the volume of cryptocurrencies about 1%. If I added in the global debt markets, it would be about 0.3%. And if I included derivatives, the value of cryptocurrency would be less than 0.1% of all the cryptocurrency market caps. This is a very important development for the whole, for Bitcoin, the crypto space, and also for, uh, for our crypto project, DAS. Um, at the beginning of the year, Bitcoin represented 85% of the of the space, the crypto space. Um, at the snapshot, when is that? January 4th, it rep represented 34%. Um, I actually think that is a very, very good thing for Bitcoin, and it's certainly a very, a very good uh, thing for the space because there's a lot of functions of these, of these crypto projects and this blockchain technology. There's store of value, where Bitcoin is clearly dominant. There is a platform services where Ethereum has been taking the lead. And there's also medium of exchange where there's a number of competitors. Maybe Bitcoin, if they can get the Lightning Network going, maybe they are best positioned. But uh, we'll see. It's, uh, you know, it's early in the, in the race. This, uh, you've heard uh, other people here talking about, about ICOs. 2017 also was the year of the, of the ICO. Um, I didn't label, didn't put too many numbers on this graph. I think the important thing to, to look at here is, is the, the diversity, the breadth of the, uh, of, the, of the spaces where the ISOs are coming from. The largest, uh, the largest slice of this pie at about one o'clock on the pie is finance at 14.71% of, uh, of the marketplace. Going down the line, you see asset management, commerce payments, payments and so forth. I think in total, and there are different information sources for this, but um, in total there were 752 ICOs last year, raising more than $5 billion. Uh, $5 billion is it's another one of those big numbers. Uh, and again, just to add a little perspective, it has overtaken early stage venture capital funding, which I think has, uh, has a, lot of people a lot of people in traditional venture capital nervous, but, uh, but not, not too nervous. Because, you know, if ICOs this year saw, you know, we saw Union Square Ventures, we saw Bain Capital, we saw Sequoia, we saw Pantera Capital, the biggest, most astute names in the market going into, going into ICOs. Uh, the money in the game also attracted some, some less savory characters. <laughs> Floyd, uh, Floyd Merriweather was one of the early ones. Um, he, he pumped three ICOs this year. Uh, two of them did fairly well. Uh, he shared one with uh, Luis Suarez. Jamie Foxx came forward uh, with Cobbin Hood, which uh, seems to be, have a pretty decent value proposition. I'm not sure how his background equates to, to that marketplace, but uh, you know, you know, whatever. I guess it, it is bringing attention, but not always good attention. My personal favorite last year was a coin called uh, Lydian Coin. It was pumped by, by Paris Hilton, and the business case for that coin is artificially intelligence-driven digital marketing. Now, there's a joke in there somewhere, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll spare you that. So, while, while this was all, all going on, um, the team from WebWallet was quite busy, and uh, I think it never, I think for most ambitious people, and most ambitious teams, you never quite accomplish you know, as much as you want to. It's only looking back when I, I think I realize how much we did, we did get done last year. Clearly, we, uh, we launched the blockchain, no small feat on its own. We, uh, we gave the community its sort of homepage um, where you, they can see their digital wallet and uh, support functions. I want to focus on support a little bit because it is, uh, I, think, uh, I think our support team has done a, done a great job th this year. And I think buildings, building support, even over building support, is going to be very, very important for the, the battles that are coming. Uh, KYC AML compliance, again, it, it seemed like something that was very support heavy, kind of a pain in the butt for people. It slowed down the growth of the network, as did the, the validator, it continues to cause some problems. And I think the 2018 is really going to, um, going to explain why we, why we did these things. Now this is, I had to put this up. This is the, um, to me, 
represents a little bit of the, uh, the state of the blockchain technology. This is the first SWOT analysis I ever found of, uh, of the state of, of cryptocurrency. Uh, SWOT analyses are loved by you know, traditional consultants, and uh, uh, this one happens to come, come from Accenture. Uh, most of us in this room, I think, understand most of the things on here, you know, the strengths, decentralized network, transparency, weaknesses, yeah, memory capability, sc scalability. The one, the one thing that intrigued me most, and what I think is the most important thing, is, uh, is an entry that appears in the opportunities and the threats, and that is uh, regulation. Um, I think a lot of players think they have it, have it figured out, and uh, when I think about 2018 and the risks and opportunities of the, uh, of the coming year, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of a quote from my second favorite sports philosopher. My favorite one is, uh, is Yogi Berra, and I'll try to work him into future presentations. But um, this one comes from uh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was talking. Um, he had a fight with Evander Holyfield, who had come up a, a few weight classes to fight him at the time. Um, everyone thought that Mike Tyson was unbeatable. Um, and, you know, Evander Holyfield, recognizing this might be his only chance to kind of pump his own image, came forward and uh, was talking about this plan, what he was to do to beat Tyson. And Tyson, what Tyson said was, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> so, to me, that's a, a theme for the coming year because I think uh, I'm seeing a lot of plans, and the plans are getting better, but there's too many question marks, and I think any serious players in the space have to be agile, and I think that's what we're all attempting, attempting to be. Uh, as mentioned before, yeah, regulation, regulation can be a great thing, and I think regulation in some form um, will come this year. Um, some of the benefits of, uh, of regulation here, investor protection, mandatory uh, disclosure requirements, uh, exchange stability, you know, KYC and AML we've talked about. Uh, once these types of regulation are implemented, it should draw uh, very serious investors to the space in bigger numbers. You know, serious angels, VCs, uh, pension funds. Um, there's even been recent talk of central banks investing in, in, in uh, cryptocurrencies, which I think would be a, a fantastic development and bring great legitimacy to the, uh, to the space. Um, the last point here is a little bit controversial. Um, it's quantifiable costs. Now, if, you have, if you're going for, a, let's say, in the U.S., a national footprint or in the world, an international footprint, and you're putting a business plan together um, and you're trying to, to quantify the costs of, of regulation, I think at current time, you really don't know what it's going to be. You can guess. But I think when investors, when serious investors guess, they take a worst case scenario and that often kills the business idea. Um, if we can quantify the costs of, of regulation, then you, know, you can put that into your business plan. Um, okay, we have some national regulation. I don't need to regulate. I don't need to pay in every state. You can quantify that and I think, uh, you know, that can be a very good thing and that can, again, bring, bring more big investors, even if it does raise the barriers of entry to some of the smaller players. A couple of uh, positive signals in this regard from two, uh, two very important people in the space, both Americans. Jay Clayton at the SEC says, we seek to foster innovative and beneficial ways to raise capital while ensuring, first and foremost, that investors are protected. So I view that as sort of a, a wait and see approach, which I think is right for this moment. The new chairman, or the, I think uh, February 8th, he becomes Federal Reserve Chairman. Jay Powell uh, says something similar. Central bank issued digital currency would compete with these and other private sector products and may stifle innovation. innovation. So again, he's waiting. Uh, from the European Union, uh, ECB President Mario Draghi is also taking a, a wait and see approach, which I think is, is wise at this stage, but uh, I think uh, at some point during the coming year, they're going to, going to act. Uh, moving a little, little more broadly, I think the cryptocurrency space is getting support from, from other areas. On the left side, you see a couple of familiar Wall Street faces. Mike Novogratz has been very, been very visible. Um, he called and, it, and is putting his money where his mouth is, the, the institutionalization of the space. Luke Ellis from Man Group, the largest hedge fund in the world, um, is, uh, was really waiting for the futures. His fund has been big in the space since. On the upper right is a face maybe you haven't seen before. Um, he, he's a gentleman that I had the, um, had the pleasure of meeting in Belgrade. He is, uh, 
He is the former director of the, of the U.S. Mint, so he was the guy that actually printed all the U.S. dollars and printed all the U.S. coins. After leaving office, he said enough of that, and he has become a, uh, a, big, a big cryptocurrency uh, proponent. I think I can encourage you all to, to check him out. He's a very, very interesting story, um, and also is, a, again, a huge supporter of, uh, of this industry. Um, looking at academia, you know, our organization has been in contact with a number of academics, a number that are, are seeking to, you know, to be leads. I went for an older guy, a guy that died uh, about 10 years ago, I think, Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman. Um, I wish he were alive today. I'd like to hear what he would say about, uh, about uh, the developments in the space because I think this quote here is from, I think, 1996 when he said, I think the internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. The one thing that's missing that will soon be developed as a reliable e-cash. And he associated this with, uh, let's say, a, even a, a greater global democratization of government. So it's a shame that he's not around anymore to expound on all of that. So um, again, ICOs were a big part of the 2017 story, um, as was, and I think regulation will be, uh, be a big part of it in 2018. We have another, um, the graph on the right, again, I don't want to go into a lot of the detail of it, but it shows the geographical distribution of blockchain startups. Um, you can see that the US and the UK together represent more than 50%, but there's also another of, uh, a number of other jurisdictions with, uh, with some serious stakes. Uh, you know, you get from Zimbabwe to Switzerland to Sweden to Singapore. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot, of, uh, a lot at stake here. There's a lot of... Um, a lot of countries, a lot of jurisdictions looking to, looking to make their stake. And I bring this up because I think that there's, a, I also want to show that there's a great, uh, a great bit of competition in becoming regulators of the different components of, of this area. Um, because regulation, as I said a couple slides ago, can be a great opportunity. It can really clarify, but it can also, if not done properly, it can also completely mess up everything that's been, been done so far. The U.S. and the U.K. have been vocal, but there's been too many voices of this cacophony of SEC, FinCEN, FINRA, CFC, etc. It's really uh, maddening and a little, little tough to follow. Um, I talked a little bit about barriers to entry, regulation, uh, too much regulation, regulation that is not, um, not prepared for future innovation, regulation that is not properly implemented can really stop a lot of the great ideas that are out there. Another risk to the, to the sector going forward is uh, what I call neo-Luddite threats. I don't expect that many people know who this guy on the right is, but um, his name is uh, Ned Ludd. Ned Ludd was the, the leader of the Luddites. He's a mythical figure. You can see he's much larger than the people behind him. He supposedly lived in Sherwood Forest, which ironically is where, where Robin Hood spent a lot of his time. But Ned, Ned Ludd was a, uh, a textile worker in Industrial Revolution England. He and his band of merry buddies <laughs> went, around, uh, went around smashing uh, looms and automated weaving machines because they, they feared, that, uh, feared that their jobs would be at risk. I grew up in Detroit in the 70s, and I witnessed, I witnessed certain neo-Luddite threats there. In, in the 70s in Detroit, there was uh, the... Oil prices were high. The Detroit auto industry was in decline. Japanese were introducing cars that were much more fuel efficient and higher quality. And if you wanted to in Detroit in that time, you could pay one dollar, get a sledgehammer, and take a whack at a Japanese car. Some people were doing it for free. So, um, so there's still you know a lot of neo luddites. You can you can also call them call them uh, technophobes out there. Uh, three guys on the left are classic Wall Street guys, Lloyd Blank Fine from Goldman Sachs. I don't like it, I'm not comfortable with it. Uh, Larry Fink, it's an index of money laundering. Jamie Dimon said, <laughs> who cares about Bitcoin? The world economy is so big. Oh, I don't really know what that means, but, um, <laughs> but it, does, it doesn't really make sense. It doesn't seem very, very well thought out. Now, the, um, the Luddite crisis ended in 1812 when a number of Luddites uh, attacked some factory and were gunned down. Now, I'm not advocating that these guys on the left get gunned down, but, you know, I wish they would just, uh, just fade away. 
there's, there's another threat. Now, this guy, you could, no one could ever call this guy a technophobe or a Luddite, but uh, this is a threat that I'm calling the, uh, the cognoscenti threat. This is a guy that I think is, uh, um, well, m most people know who Mark Zuckerberg is. There's a, an aspect of his personality that maybe some people don't know about. Every year he challenges himself. Every year he gives himself a New Year's resolution, but he can't even call them resolutions. He calls them personal challenges. One year he said, I'm going to run 365 miles. He did that. One year he said, I'm going to learn Mandarin. He did that. One year he said, I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to develop a personal home artificial intelligence system. Did that. Last year, I think he said he was going to visit every state in the U.S. to try to, you know, get in touch with people. And I expect he accomplished that. If he can learn Mandarin in a year, he could, he could do that. But um, I found his 2018 personal challenge very, very interesting. Um, I'll read it, because I just don't want to miss anything, but um, he said, with the rise of a small number of big tech companies and governments using technology to watch their citizens, many people now believe technology only centralizes power rather than decentralizes it. There are important counter trends to this, like encryption and cryptocurrency, that take power from centralized systems and put it back into people's hands. But they come with the risk of being harder to control. I'm interested to go deeper and study the positive and negative aspects of these technologies and how best to use them in our services. Now, I believe that this is his challenge, but I don't believe what he's saying. I believe that he is feeling, feeling threatened. Yeah, there's no, no reason why Facebook should be making money from all of us. It's a perfect usage case for a decentralized system, and I believe he is going in, um, he's going to be digging deeper into this, but I think he's going to do it in such a way that his own power base is, is protected. Um, there's some recent announcement the last couple of days of a sort of a shadowy uh, component of Facebook. I think it's called Business 8 or something like that. Business 8 this year plans to put a camera and a screen into everybody's home, similar to what, uh, what Google, and, uh, Google and Amazon are doing. Um, to me, it just feels too 1984. And, and I think if you have some of these people that are entrenched in the system, threatened by this, they could in a very nice way uh, do things that will block adoption of these new technologies. So moving on, to, uh, moving on to our position next year, we have seen steady growth. This is a, a graph of internet trends, Google internet trends. It basically shows the, the amount of searches of different search terms. Um, you can see Bitcoin and cryptocurrency you know, moving up steadily and then, then spiking toward the end of the year, I think with the, uh, with the options listing. Uh, Doscoin has been has steadily risen over the course of the year, and I expect that it'll continue to, to move forward into next year. This is our, our modest exchange. It is uh, modest in terms of, of numbers at this time, but there's, as Terry mentioned, there are a great number of positive catalysts that I think will, will inc greatly increase uh, demand for our coin. Um, at the moment, uh, as of a couple days ago, I checked with support and we had, we had uh, minted 449 million coins at a price of approximately 50% on a fully diluted basis. We're still, you know, 200 million, a modest figure, and certainly there's room for, room for growth in that in the coming year. I, I stole another uh, Accenture graph. Uh, on the right side, um, it shows where Accenture and other people feel we are in the development of these blockchain technologies. It had 2015 as an exploration and development phase, 2016 and 17 early adoption, 2018 to 2024 as growth phases, and 2025 as a maturity of the technology, meaning that a lot of uh, institutions and people start to take for granted the functionality that, that it's bringing. To me, that, that felt felt about right, and it tells me that uh, you know, the DAS ecosystem and web wallet are, are solidly on course. 2017, to me, was a, a laying of the foundation. It's not the exciting stuff, but it, it, it sets the base for exciting things to come. Uh, this year, again, we saw a uh, focus on customer experience. We, want to build a, we wanted the foundation to be built in such a way that uh, it's modular, that uh, new plugins, new products can be, can be brought, to, uh, brought to users in a uh, quick and understandable way. Uh, security, clearly, has also been important. Again, this is a lot of under-the-hood stuff. You know, it's kind of like playing offensive line in American football. You, you know, the only time you hear my name is if I make a mistake. 
the only time you appreciate security, the only time you, you appreciate the effort put into security is when it doesn't work. T 2018 is going to be a, a platform year. We're going to introduce uh, products and plugins into, um, into the homepage with which you're familiar. Um, the gun, the, I just talked about that basically, that we're building things in a customer experience, uh, customer experience, modular, minimalist way with security and KYC AML built in. Um, I, what you see in orange here is what was done in 2017. What you see in green are things that are, are planned for the coming year. Um, you've heard other speakers talk about them. You'll probably hear references to them later in the day. System voting and de default contracts are going to give holders of the coin a, mu a much greater say, much more governance in the system. The, there will be trade and portfolio tools. There will be curated analytics and calculators that I think will be very useful to, to investors. Uh, clearly, the external exchange and uh, linking to that external exchange will create much greater demand for the coin and much greater liquidity. Um, web wallet services will bring, bring some surprises, and of course, we continue to work on the stability and performance of the platform. I think it's going to be an exciting year. I think 12 months from now will be, uh, be uh, quite different <laughs> from what we're putting here forward, but I think it'll be different in a very good way. Thank you very much. Obrigado.